Nowadays, most vehicles driving around on the streets are fuel injected. If I remember correctly, the last carbureted production car, I think it was sometime in the early 2000s, and I'm pretty sure it was an Isuzu of some sort. Of course, carbureted cars have been on their way out for a long time. Fuel injection started taking over in the 1970s and in, into the 80s. And most production cars made after the mid-80s are probably going to be fuel-injected. However, there's still a lot of carbureted engines out there, especially in smaller vehicles such as lawnmowers and anything with small engines such as generators, chainsaws, leaf blowers. So today I will explain a little bit about how a carburetor works and some of the pros and cons about uh, carburetors versus fuel injection. Um, now, before we start this video, just a disclaimer, I'm not an expert in carburetors. I do own a lot of things that have carbureted engines and I can adjust them and clean them, but I'm not an expert in modifying and rebuilding carburetors. There's a lot of things that I don't know about carburetors. So this is just more of a broad overview. So the function of a carburetor is to mix fuel and air in the proper ratio and then it gets sent to the combustion chambers inside an engine in order to power the engine. Carburetors are actually very complicated when you get into all the little pieces, parts inside of them. Uh, there's a lot of engineering that goes into making a carburetor reliable and having it deliver the right fuel-air mixture and all sorts of things. But when you simplify it to its most basic components, a carburetor looks sort of like uh, two funnels stuck together. Now, most carburetors have a shape like this in a part that is called the barrel of the carburetor, and that's where the air moves through the carburetor. Now, larger carburetors for larger vehicles will have more of these barrels, so a four-barrel carb, you'll often hear, actually has four of these little chambers uh, laid out in a square pattern like this, and that's where the air moves through those, is through those four barrels. Uh, the carburetor on my truck, my 1952 Rio M35, is actually a two-barreled carburetor. However, for smaller vehicles, uh, for smaller engines, a single-barrel carburetor might work just fine. Air from the environment moves through here, and then it goes into the engine. Now, the reason for the shape of the barrels in a carburetor, 90% of them are going to have the same kind of uh, closing in, narrowing down shape, and then widening back up. And the reason for that, we talked about this in my exhaust video, but it's called Bernoulli's Principle, and basically um, air that is under higher pressure moves faster. And so this design actually squeezes down all the air that's coming in and squeezes it into a smaller space which makes the air move through the carburetor faster. Now that's important for being able to get all of the fuel mixed with the air. If the air is moving faster, the fuel can mix a lot better with the air that's going through. So the fuel comes into the system through these little nozzles, basically. Uh, the, the size of them, you know, depends on how much fuel is needed to mix with the air, but they can range from very, very small to kind of on the big side. But the nozzles, um, are right here on the sides of the middle of the barrel and they have specific shapes that 
make it so that the fuel and air mix together really well. Again, there's a lot of engineering that goes into carburetors. So the fuel, and there's all sorts of piping through the carburetor to deliver fuel to those, um, to those nozzles. So fuel flows in through there, mixes with the air, and then the air-fuel mixture goes to the engine. The fuel system on a carburetor, often there's, it's fed directly from the fuel tank and the, by the fuel pump, but there is a system, usually it's a little bowl, and the bowl has a float and a valve, and that sort of regulates the amount of fuel that's going into the carburetor at any point in time. There are two major controls, and then three major adjustments on a carburetor. The first control is going to be on the engine side. It controls the amount of fuel-air mixture that's allowed to pass from the carburetor to the engine. Uh, these often look like little butterfly valves, so they'll be shaped something like that, where they can open to allow more of that where they can where they can open to allow more of that air fuel mixture to go through or they can close off and not allow as much of that air fuel mixture to go through and that is the throttle so that's how you control how much of that air fuel mixture goes through which controls uh, how much power is produced by the engine. So opening it up more, more air fuel mixture, more stuff to combust, which means a bigger explosion, which means that piston is pushed down with more force, which means uh, it, you, it means an increased RPM of the motor and also increased power. And then if you have it closed, that's how your engine idles is by limiting the amount of fuel air mixture that can actually get into the engine, keeping RPMs very low when you don't need to use the engine. Usually you want the RPMs to be just high enough so that the truck doesn't stall out, but low enough so that you're not burning a bunch of extra fuel. On the other end of the carburetor, there is usually another butterfly valve that controls how much air enters the carburetor, and that is a butterfly valve as well, and it's called the choke. So it functions along the same principle where if it's closed, not a lot of air is going to get through the carburetor. If it's open, then a lot of air will be able to go into the carburetor and be mixed with fuel. The choke is mainly used to control the air-fuel ratio. By limiting the amount of air, you can have more fuel inside that air and then run a runner, uh, run a rich mixture. If you open the choke all the way, more air with the same amount of fuel, the mixture becomes more lean. There's more air to fuel. The choke is mainly useful for starting an engine and usually it's only necessary when cold starting an engine. The choke might be controlled manually with a lever, sort of, uh, lever or a knob, sort of like how it is on something like my dirt bike or in my truck. A lot of older vehicles from the 19, 1910s all the way up until in all the way up into the 50s, often had manual chokes. However, automakers then started to get a little clever, and so other choke systems were designed. So instead of having to activate the choke manually, often the choke is activated um, automatically, either with springs or vacuum pressure from the engine, um, there's a million different mechanisms. If you use a pole start lawnmower, uh, the choke is actually 
default closed, it's held closed with a spring. But then the engine turning, actually the, the fan inside that's connected to the flywheel, when that starts turning, that actually pushes on a little paddle, and that opens up the choke. So the choke is automatically closed when you go to start the engine, but as soon as the engine starts going and gets enough RPM to continue to run, the choke is opened up because of the force of that air being moved by the fan. So there's all sorts of different mechanisms that control the choke. Like I said, it, the choke is mainly used when you're starting an engine. The choke can be used to stop an engine. Let's say you have a manual choke and you turn off the car and for some reason it's still running. You turn off the car, turn off the mower, but it, it's not, the kill switch is not working. You can use the manual choke to turn off the mower. Um, I say lawnmower because this most often happens in a lawnmower that isn't wired correctly. If the uh, kill switch is bypassed, you can use the choke on the lawnmower to turn off the engine even when you, even when the electrical system is still working. And actually that's how airplanes, uh, any kind of propeller based airplane, that's how they turn off their engines. Because the engines are designed to run on magnetos, so even without any electricity or batteries, the engine generates its own electricity to be able to power the spark plugs, and so there's no like kill switch inside that circuit. So once the engine is started, it's going to keep running until you choke it out. You deprive the engine of any air, and then it can't do combustion anymore. So those are the two major controls on a carburetor. The throttle, which controls engine RP RPM and power by controlling how much of the air-fuel mixture goes to the engine. And then the choke, which controls the ratio of that air-fuel mixture by controlling how much air enters the engine. So the throttle and the choke are both adjustable. For the choke, adjusting a choke is pretty simple, you, especially with a lever-based choke that's usually run through a cable. You want to adjust it so that when the uh, choke is all the way out, it pretty much almost completely blocks any air from going into the engine. Now there's usually little holes in the butterfly valve that allow air to go through even when the valve is fully closed, but you want the valve basically fully closed when the choke is fully engaged. And then when the choke is half engaged, you want it about halfway, and then when you uh, disengage the choke, you want it completely straight so that there's no nothing impeding the air flowing into the carburetor. So that's a fairly simple adjustment. You just set the um, you just set the choke cable using the set screw so that when the choke is closed, the valve is closed, and when the choke is open, the valve is open. The throttle is a little bit more difficult because you need to set that when the truck is running, a uh, truck, lawnmower, anything. And you also want to make sure that you set the throttle when the truck is completely warmed up. If you adjust the carburetor right after starting the vehicle, before it's had a chance to get up to its normal operating temperature, then it's going to start really easily because the, the carburetor is adjusted for that like starting temperature. However, once you get into warmer temperatures, once the engine is fully warmed up, it's going to have some more problems because that air-fuel mixture and that throttle set and everything is just not going to be right for when the engine is warm. So typically you want to adjust it so that your idle is perfect when the engine is at its full operating temperature because if you think about it, that's where you're going to be using the vehicle the most is at its main operating temperature. So, you start the vehicle, you let it warm up, 
and then you've got to set the throttle. Basically, you're setting that point where the when there's no input on the throttle, so you're not pressing down on the throttle pedal at all. Where should that valve be? And there is no good answer that applies to all vehicles. So usually there's a little screw that you can turn and it'll set that position. And basically you want the engine to idle at a low RPM, like I said, low enough RPM to where it's not wasting a whole bunch of fuel, but high enough so that it's not trying to stall out. So you just have to you just have to play it by ear. So that's adjusting the throttle. So you get your idle set to the proper, um, you get your idle set to where it's good. And that's about all the adjustment that you have to do with, with the throttle because theoretically, when the throttle is closed, it's going to be at whatever set point we, you have made. And then when the throttle is fully open, so when you have your accelerator pedal all the way to the floor, that throttle is pretty much going to be like straight so that it allows all the air fuel mixture to go through without any problems. The last major point of adjustment on a carburetor is the fuel delivery rate. The fuel delivery rate depends on the size of the jets, the fuel jets here, which squirt fuel into the air so that it mixes with the air and the air fuel mixture goes to the engine. But there's normally, so those have a set diameter, but there's usually a screw that controls how much fuel actually gets to those jets. So you have a little bit more adjustability. And so with that, you want to adjust the air fuel mixture again with the engine running at idle at its full normal operating temperature. And you want to adjust that air fuel mixture so that you have, so that you can have the lowest idle RPM. So you don't want it too rich and you don't want it too lean. So uh, that's another area of adjustment. So when I'm adjusting the carburetor, typically what I'll do is I'll first, with the engine off, just set the choke to where it needs to be. Again, very simple. So after you set the choke with the engine off, you have to start the engine, get it up to its normal operating temperature, and then you just play around with setting the uh, idle set and the fuel delivery set screws. So you just go back and forth between these two until you get the idle that you are looking for. I will do a video on how to adjust a carburetor because the carburetor on my 1952 Rio M35, my old military truck, needs to be adjusted. So I will adjust that and make a video on it. But I just wanted to make a video first, kind of detailing how a carburetor works. So when it comes to carburetors, the alternative, the major alternative, the major contender is fuel injection. Now, I didn't talk about fuel injection because it really is a topic that deserves its own video. But basically, uh, instead of using the carburetor to mix the air and fuel, the fuel is fed through these high pressure systems and it's all mixed automatically and controlled by computers and so that is what most production cars will use nowadays ever since like the 1980s so i've it often comes up well which is better a carburetor a carbureted car or a fuel injected car or and this really applies to anything because fuel injection is getting more and more popular even in things that were traditionally carbureted only such as off-road vehicles and such when it comes to the number of turnkey days which means you can go out to your car you can turn the key it'll start right up and you can just drive as far as the number of days you'll have like that, fuel injection is probably going to win. 
fuel injection, the computer systems, everything is very much automated and it knows what it's doing and it can actually adjust the fuel rate quite a bit depending on demand. So um, it's probably going to start, it's not going to give you as much trouble starting. Not to say that carburetors aren't reliable because they can be very reliable, but as far as not having to touch anything except the ignition key in order to start the vehicle and then drive it around, uh, fuel injection is going to give you more of those days. However, if something does go wrong, let's say you turn the key and it's not starting, for ease of repair and ease of diagnosing, a uh, carburetor is probably going to be better. As long as you know what you're doing, you have to have that caveat. Um, people that think carburetors aren't reliable, a lot of the times they just don't really know how to work on what to do when they don't start. Uh, any old mechanic who's been around for a while and knows how to work on uh, cars with a carburetor and how to get them started, all the little tricks, they can get a carbureted car started fairly easily. With fuel injection, if it doesn't turn on, it could be a million different things and a lot of those things are hard to get to and if it's a problem with the computer, there's really not much you can do, so there's a lot that goes into just diagnosing what the problem is. The carburetors are comparatively simple, and also with a carbureted car, it gets another point for being easy to replace. The carburetor comes off of my truck with four bolts. Four bolts, you can remove the carburetor, and then if you have spares sitting on a shelf, you can just drop a new one on. Fuel injection, again, there's a lot of different parts, and so uh, it's just not as quick to replace them. So even if you can't figure out how to get this car started with the carburetor that it has, um, the clouds are passing through. It's partly cloudy, so that's why the um, lighting just tends to like change randomly. But anyway, for ease of replacement, if all else fails, you can take the carburetor off, put a new one on, either a spare or maybe one from an auto parts store, and then be on your way. For dealing with a vehicle that sits a lot, let's say you're, the vehicle has been sitting for a while, uh, maybe a couple of, up to a couple of years, the fuel injected one is probably going to start right up and the carbureted one is probably going to need a little bit of work. Again, that work is much easier to do in a carbureted car, but it's still, if it's been sitting for a while, you can't expect it to start right up. But with, uh, car with fuel injected cars, if they've only been sitting for less than five years, and especially if they, if the battery has been good in them, like if the battery has been main, maintained, or if you had taken the battery out and you put the battery back in, it's probably going to start. Um, but that is only for cars that have been sitting for less than about five years. And again, there's a whole lot of variability depending on how the car was stored, if mice got to anything. Uh, it might not start for reasons that aren't due to the fuel system. They, it might not start for a whole host of reasons. But generally, if the car has been sitting for a while, the fuel injected car will start right up. The carbureted car might need some attention. But what about, what if it's been sitting for a long time? Like more than five years, maybe ten years, which one is going to be easier to start? With that long amount of time, parts are starting to degrade, things aren't going to be working properly, and so the fuel ejected car is probably not going to start. Maybe the fuel pump's gone, maybe the fuel lines are broken, injectors are plugged, 
Um, so it's probably going to take more work to start the fuel-injected car than the carbureted car because, again, the carburetor is easier to work on. So uh, cars that have been sitting for a long time, the because both one of them are going to need work and the carburetor, carburetors are easy to work on, that point for cars that have been sitting a long time goes to the carburetor. Now, for abnormal conditions, which is uh, kind of a broad category that I thought of. Let's say you're doing some racing or some spirited driving. Uh, let's say you're driving up a mountain, extreme elevation or extreme elevation changes. Let's say it's extreme cold, extreme hot, or extreme swings in temperature. Let's say you're in Vermont, for example, it does this all the time, where in the morning it'll only be six degrees, but then it warms up to like 40, 50 by the afternoon. So those extreme swings in temperature, the fuel-injected car is probably going to be more reliable in those conditions. It's because the computer is controlling everything, the computer gets all this extra information on what the engine is doing, and it adjusts the fuel rate accordingly. So as you're driving up the mountain, uh, it's sensing that there's less and less oxygen, and so it knows to dial back the fuel in order to keep the engine happy. With a carburetor, if you're driving up a mountain, you'll have to stop and adjust the carburetor at, at points as you drive up because of that change in the air-fuel mixture because there's less and less oxygen in the air. So. For a lot of extreme conditions and when conditions are changing a lot, the fuel-injected car is going to be slightly more reliable. Again, that's not to say that a carbureted car wouldn't be good in those conditions as long as you know how to adjust your carburetor and how to take care of it. Um, so really it's a toss-up um, as to which you prefer. Um, but more often, it doesn't really come down to preference, it just comes down to what type of vehicle you have. So, uh, older vehicles, like I said, anything from the pretty much the dawn of the internal combustion engine until about the 19, maybe late 70s, but definitely into the 80s, it's probably going to have a carburetor. Also, anything that's like a small engine is probably going to have a carburetor. Um, a lot of off-road vehicles, but again, some of the off-road vehicles are now starting to come with fuel injection, but a lot of them are still going to be carbureted. Um, but if you're getting like a modern production car, any kind of like big regular production car, street car from the 1980s onward, it's probably going to have fuel inject fuel injection. So most of the time you're just choosing what type of equipment you need and then that kind of determines whether it's going to have fuel injection or whether it's going to have a carburetor. There's very few instances where you could choose the same thing and but just choose whether it's carbureted or fuel injected. Thank you very much for watching this video. That's about all I have. Uh, if you have any other topics for videos, uh, let me know down in the comments below. And yeah, thank you for watching.